Hello hockey fans, Chris Terrell here with RotorPros.com. That's right, hockey is back. It starts tonight, uh, 5.30 p.m. Eastern. We got the Flyers and Penguins. Uh, some of you new to Rotor Pros, uh, new to NHL, maybe some of you just looking for a refresher on hockey. It's been a little while here since they were in the bubble, did the Stanley Cup playoffs. Um, so I'm going to go over the sheet. Uh, nothing new added as of yet right now. All the stats are going to be from 2019 season. Um, working on a few more additions. We'll talk about that in, in some upcoming videos. But I just going into tonight, I wanted to give a few of you just a little overview of what I look at on the sheet. Um, so if we're going to start out here on the matchups tab. Um, the way team's going to be in blue. The home team's going to be in green. Uh, we're always going to be looking at that in the C column here. And then it just shows you your the opponent's obviously just going to be diagonal there. And that's just so that we can get the stats over here so we can look at Pittsburgh uh, versus their opponent and their opponent stats. That's why it's listed like that. If a team is playing on back-to-back, -back, it'll be checked. Uh, no team's back-to-back -to -back tonight. Then we've got the Vegas odds to win. We've got the over-under, um, the combined total of goals projected for both teams. Obviously, for hockey, looking for higher. Same with like football. Same with any any sport. Really, we want uh, lots of scoring for uh, projected fantasy points. Then we got projected goals for each team here as well. Um, we got team offense, so that's going to be like your um, it's goals per sixty. So everything's down to the per sixty uh, on stats when you're looking at team and player stats. So it's just the offensive rank from last season versus the defense. So Pittsburgh was seventh best offense. Philly was the fifteenth best defense. Uh, differential of eight. So obviously I put that there just to give you the differential. And uh, the higher the number, the better the matchup. Obviously, like Mer Montreal was fourth best offense. Toronto was twenty sixth defense. And even on the other side, Toronto was tenth uh, on offense. Montreal was thirtieth in defense. Both are plus 20s in terms of matchups, so that's really good. So we're really looking for that when we're doing like our stacks. Um, when I'm looking to narrow down these five uh, games, even these 10 teams down to three, four teams that I'm looking to kind of focus on. Start of the season is going to be a little bit tougher, but this is kind of the process I go through every day. So then we've got home and road offense and defense, so how a team plays on the road versus home. Early in the season, I'm not really worried too much about this. They're coming off a bubble last year, so once this data starts coming in a little more, it's, I think we can maybe get some, uh, you know, pull some things from it and find some teams that are maybe going to struggle on the road, uh, especially maybe the Canadian teams because there, there's a lot more covering time zones to go back and forth for the Canadian guys versus the the three American divisions are kind of split up geographically a lot nicer uh, for travel-wise anyway. So that's something we'll look at as we dig into the season as well. Moving over here, we're going to do some advanced stats. Uh, scoring chances, first of all. So this is just a team's scoring chances. This is all rankings. Uh, remember, um, I'm going to dive deeper into some of these advanced stats and get into the actual numbers in, in some advanced videos, but these are just rankings for now, so it's very easy to see. Your higher uh, green is going to be good, red is going to be bad. That's kind of how I color-coded this area. So this is scoring chances per 60. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. And then we got opponent scoring chances against. So, for instance, Philly is fourth in scoring chances uh, per 60 minutes while Pittsburgh is 27th in scoring chances given up per 60 minutes. So there is your differential again. That's kind of my little multiplier here, and it's really just a difference in rank. Um, so plus 20 is really good. So Philly's in a really good spot here. Going off last season stats, keep that in mind early in the season as well. High danger scoring chances. Um, I'm Like I said, I'm going to get into the advanced stats a little more, but pretty much just to sum it up, high danger scoring chances are just kind of in like a, um, a little circle around the crease of the net, a little bit outside the crease, your, your prime scoring spots for hockey, so you can really tell where teams, some teams that are taking a lot of perimeter shots, the quality of shots that are being taken. This is all stuff that we're going to start narrowing down, um, looking at cash game and GPP builds, just some more advanced stuff that we can look at in our construction. Moving on to the next section, we've got special teams. So um, power play, opponent's penalty kill, one that stands out. Not so much. Pittsburgh's power play struggled last year. They were 23rd, but Philly's penalty kill was terrible. 28th gives us a little plus rate, and that's really the only one that kind of stands out tonight in terms of a good matchup for a team. Um, 
So those are kind of the teams. That this is what I'm going to look at to kind of nail down what teams I want to stack. A power play, for instance, a team that's maybe struggling on the penalty kill. No matter how good the other team is on the power play, I want to stack that team because um, they're probably going to get a uh, – I'll maybe look at a little bit deeper into what penalties they're taking, how many penalties per game, how many power play opportunities the team's getting, and then start analyzing that way a little bit deeper. But like I said, this is going to, we're going to get into this in some more advanced videos. Then we got the record at the end. That's obviously last season's record. Um, not really relevant now. Then after that, we get into the individual player positions. So we got goalies. Um, when a goalie is confirmed, I mark it with a C here. It colors it orange so it stands out, and I erase all the other goalies on that team just to kind of narrow this player pool down when you're looking at it. Um, and making your lineups, uh, developing your player pool early in the day, whatever. Um, so we got the name, team, opponent, uh, odds again, DraftKings price, 2020 so this is last season's uh, what they average for DraftKings. there's no projections as of right now for hockey um, fan duel price fan duel points per game last season i'm going to keep that 2020 season there i think and we're going to compare just kind of see where you know players that have improved and not um, gone the other way possibly then we got stats games played wins losses shutouts goals against average save percentage i see i need to add there we go um, and then we get into a little bit of advanced stats, so shots against per 60. So really we're looking for goalies that face a lot of shots because um, scoring is a lot higher in fantasy hockey now, so shutouts are a lot more rare. Giving up even one goal is very rare um, consistently. Like in the past, we've seen save percentages as high as 935, 940, 945, touching that 950 range for some of the best goalies in the league. Things have changed. you got a 920-plus save percentage. That, you know, that's that's a pretty damn good save percentage. 915 plus even is pretty good just because you see the over-unders are now all six. We used to see a ton of five over-unders on Vegas, five and a halfs. This is just rare um, with the new, you know, just the higher scoring, the way hockey's played. There's a lot more power plays. So I like looking at the shots against per 60. I want a goalie in cash who's, you know, I'm looking for a guy that's a favorite, possibly at home, facing a weak opponent. Um, but also we got to start looking at the shots because – Unless your goalie gets a shutout, but only faces 20, 22, 23 shots, you're going to have a tough time, um, you know, with him being an, an optimal goalie to play. Sometimes, and it's very slate dependent, you're going to be looking possibly at rostering a cheaper goalie who maybe, he might even get a loss, but he's going to face 35 to 40 shots, maybe loses 2-1 because the offense isn't very good on his team. Arizona came to mind last year um, going there, or thinking about that uh, scenario, so... Keep that in mind. It's very slate dependent every day, but generally we're looking for a goalie that faces a lot of shots, that is a favorite, facing a weak opponent. Um, and that gets into our team ranks here. So this one is defense. So this is Tampa Bay's defense, opponent offense, which is Chicago. So Chicago was a bad offense last year. Tampa Bay was, you know, in the top half of the league in terms of offense, or defense, sorry. Um, so that, that makes Vasilevsky a good play. I'm definitely going to be putting him on my list tonight. Minus 260 favorite. No one even comes close to being that big a favorite. The price gap isn't that big either going down the list here. So he's easily going to be number one on my goalie list. There is some spots we can look at for sure um, in terms of GPP and pivoting because there's a lot of guys, like I said, the price is very close here, and he's the biggest favorite. He's going to be the highest owned in cash in terms of goalie. Um, we know that. So there's definitely some good places if you want to make some pivots tonight. Okay, moving on. We get into the centers, wingers, and defense. Um, same thing here, but what we start seeing now on the left of the player is a line. So this is... I'm going to just open this up here on all of these tabs. So I audit these lines every day going off practices who's skating with who, who's the top, you know, the four lines on forward, the three lines on defense, the top two lines on power play. So that's going to show here, this is your even strength line. That's the first one. Um, line one, two, three, or four for forwards. Uh, line one, two, or three for defense. And then the next column over is power play. Um, so whether they're on power play one or power play two, if they have nothing there, which I have to drag this down, Sorry about that. Doing some editing as we go here. If there's nothing there, if they've got a blank, uh, that just means they're not on the power play or not projected to be on the power play. Doesn't mean they won't get time on the power play. Just means in practice they're not one of the forwards that's going to be on the power play. That's something when determining between two players. Like just for instance, Blake Coleman. I do like Blake Coleman. Um, you know, he's 4,200 on FanDuel, but in terms of 
DraftKings, it's pretty easy when you start breaking it down. He gets a lot of shots, which give him a high floor, but the fact that Burakovsky is on line one, he's on the second power play, is the exact, you know, $100 more only on a team. I know Tampa Bay is a favorite. Coleman would be more like a, a floor or cash play, I guess you could say, and probably FanDuel only for me. But uh, Burakovsky is just in a better situation, even though he's facing a tougher team, just because he is getting power play time. And if St. Louis takes four or five minor penalties and they get that many power plays, that means these guys that don't play on the power play, you know, they lose a lot of ice time just sitting on the bench waiting for the power play to be over. So always keep that in mind when you're breaking down players here is you want guys on generally in cash games, I'm looking at the top two lines for even strength, and then I, it doesn't really matter if they're on power play line one or two because the sites that we use, left wing lock is one. I'm just going to drag that over here so you guys can see it. Left wing locks looks like this. Go up to skaters, over to line combinations, and you can go through team by team. It tells you the latest event, which was practice, the date, the power play line, the even strength line, and then it looks like this. So once this is the even strength line, once you're in there, you can go up to the top, click power play, Submit. Great site. They have an app as well. It is excellent. I think it's like $3 for the app. The site is free. Um, you know, so you can just go on your browser if you don't want to pay the, the thing, pay, pay the fee. It's three, to, three bucks or five bucks for the year, I forget. But the app is excellent as well. It's much easier to use if you're not, if you're uh, not just an iPhone, but if you're a user on your phone uh, for fantasy at all, it's, it's definitely worth it if you're playing fantasy hockey. Back to the sheets, we got stats, like I said, 20, it says playoff stats, I forgot to erase that, sorry about that again, but it's last year, last season stats here, so we got goals, assists, points, power play points, um, so that coincides, you can see, you know, guys on the power play, how did you do on the power play last year, um, plus minus, I'm not going to get into plus minus, it doesn't count for fantasy, it just pretty much tells you, you get a plus if you're on the ice at even strength, and your team scores a goal, you get a minus if you're on the ice, and the other team scores a goal. It's a little more complex than that when you get into shorthanded and power plays and that sort of thing, um, but it doesn't matter for fantasy, so I just wanted to put it there because uh, old school hockey guys really, really like that plus minus. Um, category. If someone wants to get into it more, definitely hit me up in chat. I can uh, dive into exactly how they break that down. TOI per game, that's just time on ice. So a player's, you know, obviously we want players that are on the ice more. So that's one thing that we definitely look at. Um, especially for cash games, this is one that I definitely, a stat that, I, you know, you're looking at for cash games, just deciding between right here, Landis Cog or Palat. Um, and again, this is last season stats. So keep that in mind early on. But as we get into the season and start looking at these stats a little bit more on a day to day basis, breaking down our player pools four minutes difference in ice time is a lot of opportunity um i'll take lannis cog almost every single time over Platt just because of that alone um and then we got power play ice time two and a half minutes more so that's a pretty easy decision there without even looking at any other stat for me um in terms of those two players if that was like updated stats i mean that's last season so take those with a grain of salt but that's how i'm breaking that down on a daily basis shot blocks per game i have this Oh, this one I'm going to have to look at because that isn't actually shot blocks per game. But for centers, we are going to be looking at... Um, oh, sorry, we're on defense over here. Okay, so defense, we got shot blocks. Centers, I have shot blocks. I obviously need to change where that is pulling from because that is an incorrect number compared to what we have on defense. But for centers, they do play a lot of uh, penalty kills. They're out there. They are blocking shots generally more than your wingers. So I like to put that in there as well because there are some centermen out there, probably four or five in the league or so, that do get like over a block a game. That's kind of generally the high for a center. Um, you're just looking at like a half a block, and they're, those guys aren't – you're not really looking at them. But for today, I'm just going to hide that because I know that is the wrong pull. Then we got advanced stats. So I started using these a few years back. Um, we have simple shots per game, like how many shots a player takes – per game and that's actually what that stat is here <laughs> i just forgot to take block out sorry about that today's been kind of a run around but yeah that's shots per game so that generally gives us some information but you know if you follow me for baseball i don't look at average i look at the difference in average and like woba or on base percentage in woba and i just start comparing those other numbers the advanced numbers to see if a guy's maybe running hot running cold um if he's maybe going to ascend or descend in terms of his fantasy performances so first of all we have shots per 60 all that is uh, is 
it's it's going to be the same as shots per game, but they break it down. It's a little bit easier to distinguish between players by rounding everyone to per 60 number. So that's the only difference between these two columns here. This is per game. This is per 60 minutes. Generally, it's going to give you the same information, um, but one that kind of stands out is Ryan O'Reilly gets 2.3 shots per game, only 4.9 per 60, so there's a little bit of a difference there. But take those two. Um, generally, you want the guy that's higher, Nathan McKinnon, 13 shots per 60. He gets over five shots per game basis. That's awesome. That's high volume. That's cash game. That's why he's elite uh, priced. Corsi 4, that's what CF, Corsi 4 per 60. That is shot attempts. So this is shots, they have to be on net. That's what shots are. Um, Corsi 4 is shot attempts. So that's a shot that hits the net, it's a shot that misses the net, or that's a shot that's blocked. Um, and that's per 60 minutes. So that is opportunity to me. So if I see a player that's maybe a little bit, you know, a little bit low, maybe only getting two, three shots a game right now, but are very high up there in terms of their shot attempts per game, where a couple things are maybe happening. They're getting a lot of their shots blocked or they're missing the net. Um, so they can probably, you know, you can probably see a positive regression for them. Um, on the other hand, if you see a player maybe averaging five shots a game over the short term, but overall his Corsi 4 or shot attempts per 60 is very low, we're likely going to start seeing those numbers come down. Probably a time to start fading that player because the price is probably up from his performances as well. So that is what Corsi 4 is or shot attempts is another word we use for that. Shot attempts is a lot easier to use. Corsi is used just because I think that was the name of the guy that, uh, that made the stat in the first place. So then we've got scoring chances. This is scoring chances per game, uh, or per 60, sorry, and then we got high danger scoring chances. I explained those on the team tab a little bit. Um, high danger, just a little bit closer to the net. Here's the blocks per 60 here. So for centermen, um, per, on the per 60 uh, scale, two and a half, three is about as high as you're going to get for a centerman. Um, in terms of blocks, but it does add a little extra value, especially for cash games like when you're talking Bo Horvat, getting those blocks. That really adds at his price tag and elevates him for cash games for me. So then you got the team ranks here, just like the main team tab. Offense, defense, opponent defense, sorry, differential, power play, opponent penalty kill, and that differential, so green's going to be good, red's going to be bad for that individual player's matchup. And then wingers is going to be the same thing. The only thing difference about defense is we got block shots over here because for defense, I'm looking for a high floor. And for those guys, I'm looking for a combination of ice time, power play ice time, block shots, and Corsi 4, um, or shots per 60, both of those combined. So shots, blocks, ice time. That's what I want out of my defenseman. That's a high floor for cash games. For GPP, I mean, we can start making pivots off ownership if we want. We can start looking for players that maybe don't get as much power play time, but do have upside, a lot of talent that are going to be lower owned. Doesn't even have to work. It doesn't even have to be about ownership. Um, there's just other ways I look at GPP, but I, cash games are the core of our business. I wanted to go over a few stats and how I look at the NHL sheet on a day-to-day -day basis because I play about 90% of my buy-ins every single night in cash games. So what I do, my pro process is if I'm playing 100 bucks tonight, I'm going to play 90% in cash games. That's $5, $10, $25 double ups, single entry and the most entry entrance possible. And then with the other $10, I'm going to be probably a $5 single entry contest, maybe a three max $1 or probably maybe even a three max $3, maybe go over that 90, 10, and it'll be more like 85, 15% in terms of percentages. But I, I like the three max and with my three max, like when I provide a skeleton in, or, or Ryan provides a skeleton in Slack, um, I'll usually take that skeleton and that'll be my core cash game lineup. I'll run that same one in a single entry contest. And then in my three max, I'll run that same lineup or that skeleton twice. Um, not changing the core and the skeleton, just changing the other players. And then a third lineup will just be a little bit more contrarian in that three max. And that's how I run my bankroll. Um, so when we have a bad night, or two or three in a row, it doesn't just cripple your bankroll. You're not running back to PayPal to deposit more money. You can have a couple bad days in a row because when we get, you know, we're looking to, in cash games, cash about 60, 55 to 60% of the time. That's four to five times a week out of seven days. If we cash, uh, we're, we're making profit. And those cash games essentially pay for our GPP entries. So when we cash in GPP, it's like a bonus. So that's the way I look at my bankroll. That's These are some of the stats I look at for NHL. I'm very excited to get this season started. Hit us up in Slack chat. Me or Ryan are going to take care of you for the NHL season. Good luck, everyone. Let's go get that cash.